Well, everything I've got about the football, to football, and the dedication I, and what I put into the game. You only get out the game what you put into it. And I put everything into it I could and still do for the people and for the people that I was playing for and the people that I was manager for. I didn't cheat them out of anything. So I put all my heart and soul to the extent that my family suffered. I regret it very much. Somebody said the football's a matter of life and death to you. I said, listen, it's more important than that. Bill Shankly's quote has resonated down the years. The passion, obsession that shaped his words carried with it a universal truth. Football was no mere game. Not for managers, not for players, and certainly not the supporters. Across the world, football achieved the kind of fanatical support that most religions could only dream of. Yet from its inception, football's power to engage often proved dangerous, if not fatal. In 1583, Philip Stubbs, an English chronicler, wrote, For as concerning football playing, I protest unto you it may be called a friendly kind of fight. For by this means, sometimes their necks are broken, sometimes their noses gush with blood, Sometimes their eyes start out and sometimes hurt in one place, sometime another. By the 19th century, football had been transformed. The modern game outlawed the chaos of its predecessors and invoked rules which brought football into the mainstream, or so it was thought. For although the game had acquired a somewhat unlikely respectability, it was still infused with the bloodlust of old. Certainly in Britain, uh, hooliganism is around in the, in, in the late 19th century and, and as long as, as the game has been played at a professional level. Players were sometimes attacked after matches and, and referees were literally uh, driven out of grounds. And so hooliganism has been around for, for quite some time. Pack stadiums also gave rise to concern. In 1902, 25 fans died at a Scotland-England match when the stand collapsed. 20 years later, when the new Wembley Stadium was being tested, few improvements had been made. There is this rose-tinted view of the past that somehow in the old days when we were all bundled together on the terraces that everything was wonderful, there was this great camaraderie and everything. And of course there is a very strong element of truth in that, but at the same time we mustn't lose sight of the fact that once you'd paid your sixpence, that was it. The club didn't give a damn for you. It didn't give a damn about the conditions. You were just bundled in and you had to fend for yourself and, and lots of people were injured, there were lots of heart attacks. And apart from all the great stadium disasters that have gone down in history, there were countless little episodes where people were injured and hurt badly. Despite these dangers, fans around the world were filling stadiums. By the early 1940s, football had become the global game and political leaders deeply aware of the game's popularity, descended. By the eve of the Second World War, the beautiful game had been hijacked, caught in a crossfire between two very differing ideologies. During the war, 27 million Russians died. Few received burial let alone the dignity of a marked grave. In the Ukraine, the toll on the local populace was devastating. Led by Stalin, post-war Russia sought to rebuild morale and as such, published tales of wartime heroism which might sustain a weary public. 
the death match was only one of many, many, many stories uh, which were told to us as children about the heroism of the Soviet people, including ordinary Soviet people in the war. Ну, мы знали ее, конечно, и у нас были и фильмы о футболистах, вот этих, которые участвовали в матче смерти. Было выпущено и книги, мы все это знали из истории, и, так сказать, они для нас были, видно, и образцом. In 1941, Ukraine was overrun by the German army. Several players from the top club side Dynamo Kiev were caught and imprisoned in a local concentration camp. <laughs> Unlike many, they were spared. The Germans formed them into a football team, which would play a one-off exhibition match against the Luftwaffe side. As a propaganda exercise, the match was a disaster. The Ukrainians were in danger of winning. And at half-time, an SS officer was sent to the players with an ultimatum. Das heutige Spiel ist von besonderer Bedeutung. Zu gewinnen hat es die Mannschaft Condor. In the entgegengesetzten Falle werden sie alle erschossen. The players defied the Germans and won the match. They were transported to the Babi Yar concentration camp where, still in their kit, the entire team was executed. The Soviet propaganda machine spawned a legend which remained unchallenged for many years. It was only in the death throes of communist rule that a bleaker, more complex truth emerged. Немецкие войска вошли в Киев осенью 42 года. Мне тогда было 9 лет. А вся команда, она содержалась в концлагере при хлебзаводе. Despite being forced to work in the factory, the players were allowed to form a football team, Start FC. And at the Germans' invitation, a series of matches were arranged. Что запомнилось? Запомнилось так, что на центральной трибуне сидели все немцы. Мадьяры немного сбору сбоку стояли, венгерские войска стояли сбоку. Конечно, преимущество было команды, составленной из игроков Киевского Динамо. Они победили, победили в этой игре. Во время игры было такое большое преимущество киевлян, что немцы хватались за свои парабеллы, стреляли вверх, а мадьярская команда подначивала их и кричала «Ой, ля-ля, ой, ля-ля». There, in Kyiv, they fought their little war against Germany. They beat everybody and these games were really important for the inhabitants of Kyiv, who were under occupation, uh, because they, they, they were the only victory that, in those days, the inhabitants of Kyiv could enjoy. As far as the outcome of these games goes, the Soviet version of the events was that after that only death match, everybody was shot. In fact, th these games ended uh, quietly. Nobody was shot after the last game. And uh, the, the, the players carried on working mostly at that um, bakery. Then some of them were taken to the Syriet concentration camp. And uh, eventually four of them were shot. В феврале 43 -го года там произошла такая ну, карательная акция. Немцы расстреливали каждого пятого. 
Трудно сейчас установить причину. Кто-то говорит, что пнули собаку коменданта лагеря ногой, кто-то кто говорит, что чуть ли там не ударили или как-то обидели самого коменданта. Расстреляли блестящего вратаря Трусевича, который единственный из всех повел себя героически. Ну, не обязательно вести себя героически в смертный час, но он, его пытались положить, он встал, он крикнул, Сталин придет, да здравствует советский спорт. И его расстреляли стоя. Trusevich and two others were executed. Their bodies thrown into the ravine at Baba Yar. The victory over the Germans and Trusevich's brave words should have sealed their martyrdom, but instead, they were vilified. Надо сказать, что сразу после взятия Киева, сразу после того, как начали уже разбираться в 1944-1945 году, все футболисты, принимавшие участие в матчах с немцами, имели очень большие неприятности. В частности, я помню, что сестру погибшего футболиста Трусевича расстрелянного все время вызывали в КГБ, все время допрашивали, почему ее брат остался в Киеве, каким образом он играл с немцами. Heroes, because the, the world was seen through a very two-dimensional way, black or white. They survived the occupation, they played with Germans, therefore they were almost traitors. While post-war Russia rose from the ashes, the surviving players were forced underground, their very existence contradicting the communist-sponsored deathmatch myth. Their tragedy was that, that they were never allowed just to be themselves and to play the game they loved. They had to be the banners of Stalinism, they had to keep low profile after the war and pretend that nothing happened. So all their lives they were basically tools of this big machine called history and state. And uh, unfortunately, the, the state eventually didn't treat them very well. The players had been eulogized by the state, immortalized on film, were supposed to be dead. Yet some had survived. For many, the death match was no longer a hushed tale of Soviet heroism. It was a fiction of communist invention. For others, it remains an enigma best left untouched. Опубликованы различные версии. Опубликована и эта версия, о которой говорю я, но официальной той версии, которая придерживается и общество Динамо, и украинское, и российское, это то, что это герои, пострадавшие во время Великой войны за свой народ. И пусть так будет. Люди погибли. Пусть земля и будет пухом, никто не возражает против того, что они были героями. In the post-war era, Italy, like the Ukraine, began to rebuild her fallen cities. Football, which had struggled through the war, became a part of this process. From 1946, Torino dominated the league entirely, winning three championships in succession. Era un gruppo fantastico, un gruppo eh, di, di, di mix di giovani ed anziani calciatori che vivevano per questo grande sogno che era quello di essere una squadra invincibile, imbattibile. Era una squadra che aveva dentro a questi uomini una forza incredibile, una forza di volontà, oltre che a delle questioni tecniche. E questo era il grande Torino. Despite their reputation as a side replete with stars, one shone brighter than the rest. Valentina Mezzo. Feared by opponents and adored by the supporters, 
Mazzola was Italy's first modern superstar. Questa protezione di quest'uomo che è stato il nostro capitano, Valentino Mazzola, che è stato proprio un grande personaggio del Torino, aveva verso di noi diciamo, una superiorità tecnica e di giocatore ma anche di uomo. Avevo 3-4 anni fino a 5 anni e mio padre mi portava come mascotte del Torino e avevo le mie scarpette da calcio, tutta la divisa con la maglia numero 10 e non capivo bene eh, perché la gente eh, fosse sempre vicino a lui, fosse intorno a lui eh, pensavo che fosse una persona importante per come veniva trattata da, dal pubblico Molte volte io mi aggrappavo alla sua mano per sentirmi sicuro perché vedevo tutta questa gente alta, essendo io bambino piccolo e avevo anche un po' di paura e, e la sua mano era quella che mi dava la forza. Torino's success in the Italian League brought great wealth to the club and the players. It also benefited the national team. In 1947, Italy started their match against Hungary with 10 Torino players. A feat never since repeated. It seemed nobody could stand in the way of Torino. Towards the end of the 1949 season, Mazzola promised Benfica's captain, Ferreira, that he would take a Torino side to Lisbon for his testimonial. With Torino on the cusp of their fourth successive championship, the trip seemed harmless enough. Mio padre non stava bene era... e non, non giocò la partita a Milano prima di andare in Portogallo contro l'Inter. Fino all'ultimo momento rimase indeciso se andare o non andare, ma poi si, ricordandosi questa promessa decise che non, non poteva mancare alla parola che aveva data a, a un collega. E quindi eh, andò anche lui in quella spedizione. Mazzola joined 30 others and set out for Portugal. Only Toma, who had damaged his knee, remained. On the 3rd of May, Torino lost to their Portuguese hosts. The next day, they set back for Italy. Da casa mia, io vedo Superga. Cioè, la vedo nelle giornate limpide come oggi. Ma al più delle volte non la vedo Superga. Ha capito perché? essendo a 500 600 metri è sempre presa dalle nuvole io so come succedeva e si, si preparavano le valigie si preparava diciamo ai regalini ai regalini che uno aveva comprato per dare ai bambini ma la famiglia c'era dell'entusiasmo quando si avvistava la, la propria città e senz'altro sarà successo anche allora e se non che sono andati a imbattersi in questa, in questa nuvolaglia, in questa, in questa nebbia che non ha fatto più vedere all'aviatore la, e non le ha dato la possibilità di scansare o, do, o di sorpassarlo. Difatti è battuto con l'ala e poi ci è andato, andato contro. Ecco. There were no survivors. Io li ho vegliati tutta la notte a Palazzo Madama e sono stato un po' dietro questi corpi ricomposti, diciamo, in questa bara, in mezzo a tanti, tanti fiori. E vi dirò, ragazzi, che ero vergognoso dei familiari. On the 6th of May 1949, Turin buried its heroes. While the whole of Italy mourned, one person remained unaware of the tragedy. Cercarono, forse giustamente, di, di non dirmi subito quello che era successo perché forse sarebbe stato troppo, troppo forte, uno shock troppo forte. Però fui allontanato da casa e fui portato a casa di amici di mio padre qui nella periferia di Torino eh, e quindi passai almeno 
eh, una decina di giorni senza sapere che cosa era successo. Quindi l'ho saputo piano piano e la cosa mi ha fatto chiaramente meno male sapendolo pian piano, cioè ma papà ritorna, è andato a giocare, poi sai c'è stato un incidente e finché poi mi sono reso conto da solo praticamente che, che mio padre era morto. While Sandro Mazzola would eventually step into his father's boots, forging a glittering career with Inter and Italy, Torino never really recovered. Spending the next 50 years in the shadow of neighbors and long-term rivals, Juventus. For those left behind, the void into which their team fell was as nothing compared to the lingering sense of loss. Mi mancavano i miei compagni nello spogliatoio come mi sono mancati per tutta la vita, eh, perché io faccio la preghiera alla sera e quasi quasi li nomino tutti quanti, e così al mattino. Per me la giornata è, è opportuna, diciamo, perché ho il ricordo eh, da, dalle loro fotografie, dai miei ricordi, così continuo, ecco, non l'ho mai potuto dimenticare. The Turin disaster resonated throughout Europe. Saying au revoir to London are members of the Arsenal football team as they leave for a tour of Brazil. Following the recent disaster to the Turin team, Arsenal travelled in two parties, and here are some familiar faces in the first batch. To them and to their fellow players, we wish many good games on the other side of the world. Air travel had become increasingly common, particularly after the European Cup was established. In 1957, Manchester United were England's club champions, a young side who, like Torino, were the source of their national squad's brightest talents. A year later, they flew to Yugoslavia for their quarter-final tie with Red Star Belgrade. United drew 3-3, but won 5-4 on aggregate. With a semi-final to look forward to, the squad began the long journey back to Manchester. It was a snowy day when we left Belgrade. And when we got to Munich, uh, it was the same, only a bit, maybe a little bit heavier. We got to Munich and then we went down through the clouds and the snow on the ground when we got there. And that, I thought, oh, well, that'll be it. We'll be staying in Munich by the looks of it, you know. Anyway. We went back to the terminal and of course they were refueling the aircraft and tried to take off. And uh, we thought it was taking off, but it went two thirds, two thirds of the way and whoosh, the brakes went on, you know. Then we stopped, came back, went back to the terminal and uh, tried again. Everybody was worried then, you know, I mean, it was, there was something serious, wrong, seriously wrong. And um, we all could feel, could, could feel it. And we got back into the aircraft, and all I could see was snow. And then it started again with a speed, and it started to go. And I could see the snow flying past, and bumps it bouncing around and jumping around, you know. I thought, this is unbelievable. So it's not going f fast enough to get off, you know. It started to get off a bit quicker, a bit quicker, a bit quicker. And then a tremendous thud, it, as if it hit a brick wall. And then it went on again, it still went on. And then another thud, even harder than that one, you know. I thought, oh, well, if we have another one like that, that'll be it. That's what I thought, you know. And I'm down in my seat, it's flying on. And then, psh, blackness, I didn't see anything. Out. The Munich air crash killed 23 passengers eight of them players. Like Torino before them, the tragedy placed an almost intolerable burden on those who were left behind. My life was never the same. You know, s suddenly all my, uh, my pals were missing and, uh, and uh, I'm 
playing in a team that was full of enthusiasm and, and had the whole world, the whole world at their feet. Um, suddenly, I, uh, you have to come back, and the, and the club was struggling to actually survive even in the first division. So it, it did affect me a lot. It changed my life completely, really. While Charlton went on to become a European and World Cup winner, many of his teammates were not so fortunate. Some of the survivors complained that the game had been quick to forget them. We should have been paying more attention to the survivors uh, and, uh, and all the people who had died as well. Uh, and we didn't. We were too busy getting on with the game. You know. They didn't look after the people. That's when I got the anger. Real anger. They were cast aside, more or less, more or less. Uh, a lot of it because they couldn't play football anymore, really. And some of the lads who played were suffering. That's because they were okay physically, but maybe not all mentally. But that's, that's life. While the events of Munich and Turin were tragic accidents, football has often inflicted its own wounds. I consider that the football is to unite them. How many million of them have affiliated? A world cup, how many they look at? Millions and millions of people, tanto present as on the television or on the radio. And that gives us the idea that the football, principally, is a connection of friendship and not of hate. In 1970, El Salvador went to the World Cup. To get there, they took part in the costliest campaign in football history. Honduras and El Salvador had always been brother nations. Yet in 1969, relations between their governments were strained. Honduran land reforms had seen migrant farmers expelled from their farms. As a consequence, 300,000 Salvadorians had been forced back over the border into their homeland. In the midst of these tensions came a World Cup qualification playoff between the countries. Honduras won the first match at home, but then had to travel to El Salvador. Eh, realmente eh, estábamos preocupados eh, por nuestras vidas porque eh, se había hecho mucha publicidad eh, hostil a nuestro equipo. Y puedo decirlo con toda sinceridad que estuvimos prácticamente tres días sin dormir antes del partido. Nos llevaron así como en las... Segunda Guerra Mundial, unos buses Volkswagen que había en ese tiempo, pequeños, eh, como con 10 motocicletas a toda velocidad. Y en, los, uh, en las calles estaban la, los grupos de gente tirando todo sobre nosotros. Y así jugamos. Intimidated, the Hondurans lost the game 3-1 and fled the country. Visiting fans were attacked two were killed. Passions inflamed, the border was closed between the two countries. At 5.30 this morning, Salvadorian planes did incur again over the capital. The attack of Salvador had persisted uh, throughout the night in all points of the frontier. They are being repulsed by the Honduran army detachments. We are the first to regret that this has been mislabeled a soccer war because it has much more serious consequences economically as well as politically in Central America. The conflict lasted only 100 hours, yet claimed 6,000 lives. Around the world, people wondered that a war should be sparked by a football match, that such passions could be inflamed Although for the players, the idea that they had sparked a soccer war was both repugnant and misleading. 
No, no nosotros los, eh, los jugadores en ese momento no pensábamos realmente en que era una que algo así fuera concebido para en contra del fútbol. Con el tiempo eh, analizamos de que habían otras connotaciones realmente eh, para esto, para cómo se llegaba a este partido. Los políticos se aprovecharon de esa situación. Los militares se aprovecharon de esa situación. Es una lástima porque yo considero que el fútbol no debe ser una excusa para este tipo de problemas. El Salvador and Honduras played the deciding match in the series at the Azteca Stadium in Mexico. The Salvadorians won the game, but were then punished at the finals. Their early exit, perhaps the only appropriate outcome to an event that edified neither football nor the countries involved. If the conflict between El Salvador and Honduras had seen war being waged on football, throughout the world, football was waging war on itself. Tensions on the pitch were slowly being eclipsed by events in the stands. In 1964, 364 people died when violent scenes at a match in Peru led to a crush. The incident was by no means the first full-scale stadium disaster, but it was the largest. Worldwide, football authorities took note, not least in Britain. The big debate then in the newspapers in Britain was about the, the terribly uncivilized behavior of supporters in South America, or in Latin countries, in Italy, for example. Because in South America and in Italy, uh, supporters were already fenced in. That hooliganism was clearly part of the local fabric of the game there. And there were already fears and anxieties about supporters' behavior. Of course, a little later on, interestingly, uh, people in Europe began to say that this is an English disease, that we were infecting other countries with, with, with hooliganism. So the picture here is very complex and, and, and you have to look at the global picture to get a real sense of, of, of the history and trajectory of hooliganism. In England during the 60s, hooliganism was increasingly a part of the football program. And a small boy has now leapt onto the field in the middle of the field and he's joined in and he's taking punches at, uh, and kicks and punches on number 10 is Les Barrett. Where has this idiot come from? Policemen coming in from all sides. Why does this have to happen in football here? Why? Why? Basically, the clubs lost any ability to know how to deal with the situation they were confronted with. And that was basically that they had a hard core of supporters who were dead set on causing trouble inside the grounds. The clubs, in order to contain this, they put up these terrible fences. They cage us in like animals. And of course, once you cage people like animals, they increasingly start to behave like animals. Where in league football, rivalries were based on regional differences, at an international level, such bigotries could be broadened out, manipulated to dangerously high levels. The England national team began, particularly in the, in the late 70s, early 1980s, began to be seen as, as, as the symbol again of a kind of lost England. And so for some young men, they saw the England team, and particularly traveling abroad with the England team, as a way of kind of reasserting the strength and the power of the English abroad. The growing spiral of violence that accompanied England's clubs and national team soon made it an outcast in European football. In 1985, Liverpool played Juventus in the European Cup final. The venue, Heisel, was a rundown stadium in the center of Brussels. Here we were, um, a 
about to take our chances against a great team in Juventus, Michel Platini and everybody. It was a, should have been a great night. It wasn't. Before kickoff, fighting broke out on the terraces. Liverpool fans charged their Italian counterparts. A wall collapsed. 39 died. Those scenes that we saw just along from our dressing room were awful. And they'll stay into everybody's minds until they die. Two great teams, um, 11,000 tickets each and 11,000 to neutrals. It was an inept stadium, uh, an athletics track, really an athletic stadium, for a big, 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 massive football game. And the people that were responsible for choosing that should have been hung, drawn and quartered. While football's hierarchy survived, English football was deemed beyond help. UEFA cut their clubs adrift, banning them indefinitely from European competition. Isolated, English football began the long descent towards oblivion. On the 15th of April, 1989, Sheffield Wednesday played host to an FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. Day started off absolutely brilliantly. Uh, beautiful sunny day. Uh, Adam and I travelled over the uh, Woodhead Pass with uh, two friends. We had a great laugh. So much so that on one occasion Adam was actually uh, crying with laughter. Walked down towards the ground. We got there about half two, something like that. It was just chaos. There was no cues, nothing. Uh, and then someone opened the door gate and uh, everyone just started walking down. It wasn't a case of ticketless fans conspiring to get in, drunken people fighting to get in. All of those were the myths of, have been the myths of Hillsborough. It was purely and simply a rival of fans coming off coaches, coming, on, coming from the trains, coming from the car parks in an orderly fashion and too many people were arriving for the pace of the antiquated turnstiles to take them through. Somehow, I don't know really how, but uh, we ended up right at the front, right on the perimeter track. Uh, a gate leading out onto the pitch was in my arm's reach. And uh, next thing the players come out the tunnel and that was it. All hell broke loose then. Those two central pens, one of which had a, a license for 1,000 people, the other had a license for 1,100 people, had twice as many people in them. It was like a vice and it got tighter and tighter until at the front of one of the pens, pen three, a barrier broke and people went down on, under the pressure from behind into a mass of tangled bodies. They all collapsed here. Adam fainted. I tried to pick him up. They got out this fence, which uh, at the time, you know, it, it appeared about you know, 12 foot high. And uh, I was trying to lift them up. Couldn't do that. There was a policeman standing on the perimeter track by the gate. He was only a matter of feet away, and I was screaming at him to open the gate. And uh, believe me, when I say I was screaming, I was. I was saying that my lovely son was dying. I uh, woke up in the hospital on the Sunday. Um, took me off the ventilator. And uh, I wanted to know where Adam was. 
So they, they didn't want to tell me, but I started pulling all the tubes out. So I made them tell me, and they told me he'd died. 96 people died, 400 people were hospitalised, 700 people were injured, and thousands of people were traumatised. It was the worst football disaster, worst disaster at a football stadium in British football history. And I think that the issue is that it was always on the cards. It was entirely predictable. It was entirely foreseeable. The way in which grounds had come to be uh, left, more or less to go to rack and ruin, the way in which grounds were not safety oriented, the way in which the police were not safety oriented remains one of the great scandals of Hillsborough to this day. The country that had given birth to the modern game now mourned its dead. Horrified by the sheer scale of the disaster, the authorities took action. Lord Justice Taylor was appointed to head a government inquiry into the tragedy. His conclusions proved a damning insight on the conditions within England's stadiums. What the Taylor report does uh, at this, this awful watershed in the history of football, April 15th, 1989. What Taylor does is he says, enough. And what he does is he lays down a set of very stringent, tough, difficult guidelines. You will go all seater. You will do this by August 1994. We will set up a government body to watch over you, to make sure that you do this. This had never been done before. Government had never got so involved. The whole football industry was revolutionized. And Lord Justice Taylor said something which I think was very important. He said, my aim is not to drag football and prepare it for the 21st century. He said, I want to drag football into the 20th century. And I think to a large extent, he was right. While England had the financial resources to overhaul its facilities, in Africa, football and its infrastructure were left to fend for itself. A situation which in 1993 would rob Zambia of its entire national squad. It was one of the greatest football team that Zambia had ever put together in its history. These were under 23 young lads with blood oozing with the Zambian glory as far as football was concerned. They were ready to conquer Africa. They were ready to conquer the world. On the 24th of May, Zambia flew to Mauritius for a World Cup qualification match. Kelvin Mutali, their powerful centre forward, scored a memorable hat trick. Victory secured, Zambian thoughts now turned to their next World Cup qualifier in Senegal. A prospect tempered by the thought of another journey in the aging Buffalo aircraft, their impoverished FA, at least for the squad. When they went to Mauritius, they were given this army plane. It wasn't good and the players complained. And when they came back, they wanted to have this commercial plane to take them to, you know, to Senegal but the government insisted to, you know, to use the same plane. The Zambian FA saved $25,000, a price the team would be forced to pay. On the 28th of May, 1993, just off the coast of Gabon, Zambia's plane crashed. The loss of life, catastrophic. I was at the saloon when I received the message that the plane has gone missing, which was carrying the Zambia national team players and the officials. But in actual fact, we discovered later that it has crashed and there were no survivors. In 
in an irony not lost on the families of the dead, the players were flown back from Gabon in a Zambian Airways DC-10. Their coffins were taken to the independent stadium in Lusaka, where a cemetery had been prepared. To a country wracked by grief, Frederick Chiliba, the Zambian president, delivered words of hope. We must start now, this month, to build a new team so that the hopes don't lie with you still in these graves. Faz decided that we'll continue with the competition in the Africa Cup of Nations and the World Cup. Where are you, the young Zambians, to take up the challenge? Don't bury the hopes. Don't bury the aspirations with the heroes now departed. Zambia's World Cup fixtures were postponed. Their fallen team rebuilt. And on the 4th of July, Zambia arose. The independent stadium sold out for their World Cup qualifier against Morocco. It was really an emotional moment. And Zambia went down a goal in the first half. And this mood was just silent. And everybody thought, no, we're not going to be able to come back. I think the loss is destroyed. And certain fans on the top tier who, who, were over, who were overlooking the graveyard in the background turned and appealed to the players who, who had passed away. Uh, quite a few people were in tears. It was a very emotional moment. Zambia got back into the game, scored a beautiful goal. And all of a sudden, Zambia started playing like, like we hadn't seen them play before for a long time, a positive feeling. Eventually, we won the game 2-1 and was there that Zambia could do it once again, that we had risen from the ashes and would have an impact once again in football. But it was not to be. Needing only a point from their last match to qualify, Zambia lost. The World Cup had proved a powerful distraction at a time when a nation needed to hope. But in its aftermath, Difficult questions had to be asked. Sometimes I wonder and say, why did they not go by that commercial flight? Was it worth the money we saved, saved in inverted commas, for them to go into that death trap of a buffalo plane and to see their wives and children and their relatives in poverty, it's tragic. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God. Chilaba's emotional speech at the funeral, his tears had been backed up with a promise to support the families and probe the cause of the crash. Yet in the following years, no compensation was paid and no crash report was issued. It was a situation which left many of the families angry with their government and with football. He cried, yes, because it happened. But, but one thing they forget is that it's us, the widows, the children, the parents and the relatives and friends who have lost. I don't support football because the government has neglected us. So every time they win, they celebrate and forget about the previous team. I feel bad and hate and neglected. So if they lose, I think maybe someone somewhere will remind them that something is wrong somewhere. Zambia's loss, like those before it, says little about football and perhaps more about the society we live in. The game's power to shock, its capacity to horrify, is devolved not from football itself, but from the millions of fans who have made it their world. And despite the tragedies that have beset it, it is this collective passion that drives football ever onward.
Somebody said the football's a matter of life and death to you. I said, listen, it's more important than that. His quote sometimes hurts, you know, when he... But, I mean, then you realise what the quote was all about and when it was made and things like that. He just loved football and uh, I love football and to me it was worth an awful lot. I don't love it now. Believe me, there's nothing more important in this world than life. Greatest gift that everyone receives and I think you've got to tre treasure it and I don't think we do.